Welcome to Omics Box, bioinformatics made easy. Hello everyone, my name is Fabian Jetzinger and I'm a PhD student in bioinformatics studying long-read transcriptomics here at Biobam. Today, I would like to show you how to perform quantification and functional analysis of long reads in Omics Box. So in the second session of our webinar, we will continue with the high quality transcriptome that Enrique uh, produced for us using Flare and Scanty Free. And now we will see how we can quantify our long reads using this transcriptome with isoquant, how we can perform a differential gene or transcript expression analysis with EdgeR, and how we can later use a combined pathway analysis with the CAG and React Home databases. First off, let's talk about isoquant, which is a computational tool for the uh, identification and quantification of isoforms. So we could have already used this tool for the original definition of our transcriptome. However, today we chose to use Flare instead, which is a decision mainly based on the results of the uh, longer GASP comprehensive benchmarking efforts, which was recently released uh, or published rather uh, in the Nature Methods Journal. Um, so isoquant is a tool which, according to their results, was recommended for the study of known isoforms, as well as for the quantification of long reads. However, since their recommendation for the re discovery of novel isoforms uh, was mainly recommending Flare, we chose to use this for the original definition of our transcriptome. And now we are showcasing isoquant as A, an alternative, and B, a method for uh, quantifying our long reads. So isoquant performs read assignment based on creating splice junction and exon profiles for each individual read, as well as each transcript model in our transcriptome. And then it looks for matches between them. It would also perform isoform identification, so the creation of models for novel uh, transcripts uh, based on the creation of intron graph and then observing the paths that the various reads take through this graph. However, today we will just be skipping this step because we are already happy with our high quality refined transcriptome. And next, with isoquant, you can all also obtain both gene and transcript level quantification results. However, when speaking about quantification with long reads, we have to be aware that long reads also exhibit some uh, specific biases in terms of quantification. For instance, we have observed uh, that uh, there is a bias towards shorter transcripts, which, me which means that when you are quantifying long reads, uh, shorter transcripts may falsely appear to have higher expression levels than uh, longer transcripts do. Uh, Biobam is actually contributing to some really exciting research together with our collaborators to look further into this subject of these long read specific biases and how to best uh, address them. So in the future, with insights gained from this research, uh, hopefully we can get more of an idea of what these biases uh, look like and how researchers can best handle them. For now, we will just work with uh, the quantification that we get from isoquant. Now, next on, once we have our count tables on both the gene and the transcript level, we can move on with a differential expression analysis. Uh, so depending on your experimental design, Omixbox offers three different options here. The first one, a pairwise differential expression with EdgeR, requires that you have multiple biological replicates uh, for your conditions. Uh, the second option, the pairwise differential expression with Noisec, uh, can work when you only have one uh, replicate for each of your condition, and it does so by simulating those repli uh, replicates. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a, an, an experiment based on uh, uh, expression changes uh, over multiple time points, you can use time course expression analysis with Masic Pro. Now, uh, for our experimental situation, which to remind you, uh, our PAC bio long reads from brown bears, where specifically we are looking at differences in the hibernation versus the active state of the adipose tissue of three brown bears, two male and one female, which means that we have some biological replicates, so we can safely use uh, EdgeR for our differential expression. Uh, then we will also look into the combined pathway analysis in our mixbox. Again, we can perform this both on the gene and on the transcript level. Uh, we can link up our sequences to pathways from the CAG, Reactome, and Gramine databases, which is Gramine is uh, specifically for plants. Um, and we can link our sequences to those pathways through several methods. First of all, if we have already obtained uh, functional annotations for our sequences, we can simply use those uh, gene ontology terms as well as the enzyme codes to link up to both Reactome or Gramine and CAG pathways. Uh, secondly, we can link to reactome or gramming pathways also using proteins, uh, protein IDs by performing a blast on unannotated sequences, or we can link to CAG pathways using EGNOG again on not yet annotated sequences. 
So with that out of the way, uh, I think we can move on into Omnixbox and give you a bit of a more practical introduction to how we can uh, perform all of these different analyses. So here in Omnixbox, I've already loaded all of the results that I uh, need for today's session, and we'll go through them one by one and uh, show how we can perform these different analyses. So first of all, uh, of course, I have all of the files that Enrique produced for us, namely the uh, transcript tome and the reads. Uh, so I can now look into the transcriptomics module of Omnixbox, and under long read analysis and transcript identification, I will find identification and quantification with isoquant. Now, in our handy wizard here, we can first introduce our reads. Uh, in this case, I chose to uh, introduce them as uh, gzip compressed FASTA files for all six of our different samples. You could also, if you have already aligned your reads uh, to the reference genome, provide the bumps directly. Uh, of course, we also need to provide our reference genome, which I have also already done so. On the next page, uh, we can choose whether or not to use a reference annotation. Uh, of course, uh, well, isoquant can also work without a uh, reference annotation, in which case it will uh, simply discover novel isoforms based on the reads. Uh, but since we want to quantify based on our already existing and refined transcriptome, I have supplied this here as a reference annotation. Next, we can configure uh, isoquant with some different options, uh, where here it is most important to select the appropriate uh, data type, which for us is PacBio full-length non-concatamere reads. So I've also checked this long read transcripts mark here. Uh, now we can select different strategies where uh, for today we can skip the model construction uh, selection uh, because we won't be performing this. And then we can also uh, configure our quantification options separately both on the transcript and on the gene lab. Now to understand these different options, which namely are unique only, with ambiguous, with inconsistent, and all. It is important to understand what isoquant considers to be an ambiguous versus an inconsistent uh, sequence or read. Uh, so for an ambiguous read, it is not quite clear uh, to which transcript or to which gene uh, you can assign it. Uh, so by default on the transcript uh, quantification, we want to count those ambiguous reads, even if we're not quite sure is it this or that transcript. Uh, and it does, uh, isoquant counts these uh, ambiguous sequences by simply uh, splitting it with, with equal weights. So if we're not sure uh, where to assign our reads, for, uh, for instance, between two different transcript models, then it will simply count them as 0 0.5 for both. Uh, on the gene level, however, if a sequence is ambiguous, meaning that we're not sure which of two or more genes it belongs to, then we don't want to, or at least by default, isoquant doesn't want to count uh, those uh, those sequences. Uh, on the gene level, uh, however, we need to talk about inconsistent sequences, which is, if you remember what I just told you about the read assignment in isoquant, uh, when the splice junction and exon profiles uh, are created for each read, as well as for each transcript model, uh, an inconsistent read uh, is one where the splice junction and exon profile does not have a, a perfect match to any transcript models. So we have at least one splice junction that is different from any of the transcript models that we have defined. Uh, now these inconsistent models, we uh, or these inconsistent reads rather, uh, we are not counting on the transcript level because, well, we wouldn't know where to put them really. Whereas on the gene level, as long as we can clearly say that the read belongs to this specific gene, it is still fine to count them. Uh, so. This subtle difference, however, also means that uh, our gene counts will not be exactly equal to just grouping up and summing our transcript counts. So that is another uh, little detail to be aware of. Now, finally, we have configured isoquant in the way that we want, and we can move on to the output options, where uh, today I will only need the reference gene counts as well as the reference transcript counts. We could, of course, also obtain uh, new transcript model annotations, so a new transcriptome, but since we have already discovered uh, our novel isoforms with Flair and further refined our transcriptome with Scanty3, we're not interested, at least not right now, uh, in the novel isoforms that isoquant may define for us. Uh, likewise, we don't want to obtain uh, counts for those uh, novel isoforms that would be discovered by, by isoquant. Uh, we are only interested in quantifying based on the transcriptome that we have already defined and finalized. 
Um, so what we can do is only uh, select these two output options. And this will, in the background, also let Omixbox know that we're not interested in the discovery of novel isoforms at this time, which will say uh, skip the model construction step of isofund and thereby save some valuable time as well as computational resources to let us perform this analysis a bit faster and more efficiently. So now we are ready to run our analysis. Of course, I've already done so ahead of time, and I can skip ahead to the results. So first, down here, you can see that we obtain uh, an isoquant summary report, which again lists all of the input data that we used, as well as the reference data, and some basic statistics uh, on our reads, their assignment and alignment, and as well the parameters that we used. So you can always trace back if you're not sure for which analysis you used, which files or which parameters, you can also uh, always check in these reports to make sure that you're not getting your results confused with one another. And then, of course, we receive our actual quantification data, which is the reason that we want to use isoquant. Uh, so here I have a count table on the gene level, where we see for each gene, we obtain our counts separated into six columns for each of our samples. And we can see that we have identified some very highly uh, expressed genes and some rather lowly expressed genes as well. And then we uh, also obtain, of course, a very similar table uh, on the transcript level. So now each line is a transcript. And again, we have our six columns uh, of our different samples. Now, great, we have uh, successfully quantified our long reads uh, based on our existing transcriptome. So of course we have our quantification data now, but what we actually want to do is compare our two conditions of hibernation versus active to identify any genes or transcripts that might be differentially expressed. So as I have explained beforehand, we can simply go to our, well, for instance, in this case, the gene level quantification table. And in our sidebar, we can select the option of differential expression analysis. Now we can choose between uh, the pairwise differential analysis, the pairwise differential expression analysis without replicates and the time course expression analysis. But of course, since we have three different samples across our two conditions, uh, we can choose to work with HR. So on the next page of our wizard, uh, we can select to filter our uh, lowly expressed genes or transcripts. Uh, by default, this is uh, simply set to filter out any, uh, tr any, any features, any genes or tra uh, transcripts, which uh, show zero expression for all of our samples, which for our pur purposes right now is perfectly fine. Next, uh, you can supply your experimental design with a simple text file, which I've already prepared and loaded ahead of time. So you can see here, uh, each of our six samples is mapped to the different conditions that we are observing, namely the sex, the tissue, where today we're only looking at the adipose tissue, and the condition, which is active and hibernation. And the condition here is the one where we will actually be performing our test today, which we can select on the following page. So we can opt for a simple test design, where our experimental factor will be the condition I have defined in the experimental design, and for the contrast condition, we will select hibernation, whereas active will be our reference condition. We can select a uh, statistical test. For today, we will choose an exact test, make it robust, and we are once again ready to run our analysis. As I've already obtained the results ahead of time, I can simply skip ahead to those. Now, this time I performed it on the gene level, and we obtain a little summary report once again with some basic statistics to give an overview. Uh, and we can see that on the gene level, we have uh, identified 70 differentially expressed uh, features, or genes in this case, rather, um, which means simply that uh, their false discovery rate is uh, under uh, 5%, and we have obtained a statistically significant p-value as well. Um, so eight of those genes are upregulated, meaning that they show statistically significant higher expression um, in uh, hibernation versus the uh, active uh, state, uh, which is also uh, now, according to our uh, settings, defined as having a log fold change over one. However, on the other hand, the downregulated genes with a log fold change under minus one, we have found 62 of them. So uh, we find uh, a much higher number of downregulated genes rather than upregulated ones, which one may assume that might be due to the overall slower metabolism uh, in the hibernating brown bear. 
Uh, great. So, of course, we also obtain a table with our differential expression results here that I can uh, sort by the associated tags, which will actually so, uh, show us uh, all of the genes that we have uh, observed, uh, in this case, the downregulated ones, and their fault changes, uh, false discovery rate, their uh, log uh, counts per million, the log fault change, as well as the p-value. And we can scroll down here to also, of course, find the upregulated genes as well. Great. So we have performed a differential gene expression analysis. Now let's go once again for a differential transcript expression analysis by simply navigating to our transcript count table, once again performing a differential expression analysis. We will keep the same filter settings. We have the same experimental design. We can put in the same simple design of condition with hibernation versus active as a reference condition and perform the same test once again, but this time on our transcript count table. And in this way, we perform a differential transcript expression analysis. Once again, we obtain a summary report, which uh, summarizes our results, of course, um, where we can find that we have now obtained uh, 46 different uh, differentially expressed transcripts, whereas 15 of which are upregulated and 31 of which are downregulated. So we can already see that there's uh, quite a difference here between looking at the, the gene and the transcript level. So it is definitely uh, worth, worthwhile to uh, look at the, the isoform, the transcript resolution as well, um, because the, the transcript can have uh, quite different behaviors as well. Once again, I can look at the, uh, uh, rather sort by the tags that our differential expression analysis has assigned to our sequences. And we can look at our, uh, Downregulated transcripts as well as our upregulated transcripts. Great. So now we know which of our genes and which of our transcripts may be uh, associated with the uh, changes in the conditions, namely the hibernating versus the active brown bears. Uh, but, well, at least for today, we won't stop here. We are also interested in what sort of uh, functional uh, implications these sequences might have. So what sort of uh, functions uh, might be, um, well, important in the uh, hibernating versus the uh, active brown bear and how do our uh, sequences that we've identified relate to that? Uh, so I've lo uh, loaded our gene sequences, first of all, here um, into Omixbox, which Omixbox actually has a very nice uh, little tool uh, that is very helpful uh, to load these sequences. So under the functional analysis module, under load and load sequences, we can find an option to load faster from reference plus GFF. So if we don't have our, uh, the, the actual uh, gene or transcript sequences from our defined transcript tome, uh, and we only have a, a GTF annotation as well as a reference genome, then we can actually use this little tool to load uh, the sequences for each individual gene or transcript. So for instance, if I go through here and I select uh, our reference genome as well as our uh, annotations, which is the uh, refined transcriptome that we created in the first session of our webinar today, we can uh, select that we want our sequences on the exon level and we want to group and name them either by the gene ID, which will give us the gene sequences, one sequence per gene, or on the transcript level. And then we can also alter the description template to, for instance, uh, include the ID of our transcripts as well. And if I would click on run now, I would obtain our, in this case, based on my uh, selection here, uh, our transcript sequences. So I did the same, uh, the same process, once for the genes, once for the transcripts, to obtain our sequences. Uh, now, I will show the combined pathway analysis next in our functional analysis module. Again, once on the gene level and once on the transcript level, so we can really see that what sorts of uh, benefits we get from looking at the transcript level. Uh, now, many Omixbox users are already uh, very familiar with the uh, very uh, interesting functional analysis module of Omixbox. So I will skip over these steps a little faster. However, if you're uh, not already very familiar with the functional analysis capabilities of Omixbox, uh, then I will put a link in the uh, chat for you of the webinar. Uh, to learn a little bit more uh, about these uh, function analysis po possibilities that Omixbox offers us. So first of all, to perform our combined pathway analysis on the gene level, uh, we can simply take our unannotated sequences, so we don't have any functional information uh, relating to these sequences yet, 
um, and in the functional analysis module, I can select combined pathway analysis. Great, so first of all, of course, we need to load our sequence uh, sequences where I have loaded our unannotated gene sequences. Uh, we can load our differential expression results. Of course, I have loaded the differential expression analysis that we have performed on our genes. And we can se uh, select that we want to uh, also perform a pathway enrichment analysis using both the gene set enrichment analysis as well as Fisher's exact test. Now, next, I can configure the different pathways that I want to consider for my analysis. Uh, today, I want to consider the uh, reactome pathway analysis, where since my sequences are not already annotated, I will run a blast to link uh, my sequences to these uh, reactome pathways via protein IDs. I could also choose to give priority to a, um, a specific taxon. For instance, if uh, uh, if my, well, if my uh, organism is in this list, however, since the Ursus arctos is not a model organism, it's not particularly well studied, um, it is not available here, and I will simply ignore this option for today. Now, next, the gramine uh, pathway analysis is uh, based on plants, so of course it's not relevant for our brown bear, and I will simply skip this step and move on to the CAC pathways, which very similarly, uh, since I haven't already annotated my sequences, I will simply use the eggnog mapper to obtain CAG orthologs, which we will link to the CAG pathways. Now, I'm ready to run this analysis, but as always, I have done so beforehand. And we can see our summary uh, report once again gives us an overview of our results. And we can look at the actual uh, pathway results that we obtained. Uh, so we can see for each pathway, whether it is from the CAG or from the reactome database, um, the number of sequences which uh, are associated with this, uh, with, well, with any step in this pathway, uh, and whether this uh, pathway was found to be uh, 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 statistically significantly uh, enriched with uh, different uh, functions relating to our sequences. Um, so, of course, we have uh, a vast number of very complex uh, pathway maps here, and we don't have the time in this webinar right now uh, to look into all of them in detail. But I have ahead of time already identified one uh, particular pathway that I uh, want to show off and look into the results. So I can search for the specific pathway by name here. And the one that I've chosen to look into today and to, to showcase to you is the tryptophan metabolism, uh, which is a CAG pathway. So I can right click and show the pathway diagram, which will open our uh, pathway map of our tryptophan metabolism, which takes a second or two. And I can, of course, make it a little bit bigger so we can actually see what is going on. So of course, these uh, pathway maps are rather uh, complex and uh, for uh, well, uh, with uh, with lacking uh, expertise can be very hard to read, uh, but Omixbox has some uh, very useful features to showcase the results of our analysis. So first of, all, uh, first of all, in the colored boxes, you can see the reactions where we have obtained uh, sequences which may be relevant to this specific uh, reaction, for instance, to this specific enzyme. Uh, we can choose to paint the expression data of our sequences in the map which will show us um, for which of these reactions we have actually found sequences which are relevant to those enzymes. And we have even uh, found them uh, expressed in our data. And we can further uh, choose to show only results with differential expression data, which here, uh, again, to remind you, we're doing this pathway analysis right now on the gene level, shows that we have only observed one reaction down here uh, for this enzyme that uh, one of our sequences is relevant to and differentially expressed between our conditions of hibernation and active. So we have seen that this specific gene uh, is possibly relevant to this enzyme um, or associated with this enzyme. And it is differentially expressed uh, in all three of our samples to different degrees um, between hibernation and active phases. So, of course, we might uh, look into this in uh, a little more detail to find out uh, what the, the meaning of this reaction is, what is this uh, gene that we have uh, identified this orpholog for. Um, 
but for today we can uh, simply move on and you have now seen how to perform the combined pathway analysis on a gene level of course we can do the same on a transcript level however we will do it uh, a little bit differently uh, namely uh, we have uh, I've already ahead of time obtained some uh, functional annotations for our transcript sequences. So you can see that I've performed uh, an interpro scan. I've used blast to go to obtain goal terms. And I've also used the eggnog mapper. So now uh, our sequences are annotated with both uh, different goal terms as well as enzyme codes. And we can use these annotations that we have obtained ahead of time for, uh, uh, well, we can of course uh, have diff have uh, different plotting options and uh, look into, for instance, the results of our BLAST uh, and of our uh, mapping uh, in, in more detail. But today I will simply use them to once again link up uh, to our combined pathway analysis. And of course, this time I will select uh, our uh, transcript sequences, which I've already annotated. which are right here. Then I also need to, of course, select the correct differential expression results, which are here for the transcript level. And then on the transcript level, I will choose not to perform the pathway enrichment analysis. And this is because uh, we have uh, observed together with our collaborators that performing an enrichment analysis on transcript level uh, can be rather unreliable because the transcripts and their expression levels are not exactly independent of each other. For instance, for a very highly expressed gene, we have a uh, higher likelihood that we will also uh, observe a high number uh, of, of different uh, isoforms um, because we will, for, for highly expressed uh, genes, we will have a variety of sequences where our algorithm, uh, in our case FLARE, might produce a, uh, a high variety of isoforms all belonging to the same gene. And what can happen then in the enrichment analysis is that we don't really get reliable results where we find out which uh, functions are um, differentially uh, enriched, but rather we simply find genes that have a lot of different isoforms uh, defined to it. So hopefully further research in the future can also uh, help us find uh, solutions for this problem. But for today, we'll simply say, uh, that the enrichment analysis for transcripts is not particularly reliable, so we will skip it for today, and we will, as we will see, we will still uh, obtain some very nice and interesting results. So again, for the uh, reactome pathway analysis, we can uh, link to our uh, to the reactome database. This time, not by uh, running another blast, since of course I've already done so. I've obtained my annotations, so I can use the existing genome ontology terms uh, to. Uh, uh, yeah, link up to our pathways. Next, again, our gramine pathway analysis for plants, we will turn off as it's not relevant to our brown bear. And finally, for the CAC pathway analysis, uh, similarly to before, we have already obtained enzyme codes for our sequences, so we can safely use those existing annotations to link up to CAC pathways. Once again, we're ready to run this analysis. I've done so ahead of time, and we'll skip ahead to the results, which I can simply close some windows here so I have a more clear view of our pathways. And once again, we see a list of both reactome and uh, CAC pathways that uh, may be relevant uh, to our uh, particular sequences, this time transcript sequences. And I've sorted them here by their number of differentially expressed uh, sequences. And I've identified here, again, the same uh, pathway, the tryptophan metabolism, has uh, seven differentially expressed sequences. Now, through looking through some of these uh, pathways, I have identified that there are uh, several sequences which are um, differentially expressed for many different pathways. Specifically, I've seen some that are uh, annotated with the uh, with an uh, enzyme, namely the unspecific monooxygenase, which is important to many different reactions uh, to uh, in in many different pathways. So of course they show up multiple times here, but still uh, seven differentially expressed sequences uh, sounds like something that may be interesting to us. Uh, so I've chosen to examine this pathway in a little more detail. 
So once again, just as I did on the gene level, now on the transcript level, I can open the pathway diagram for this pathway map. And we can look at it in a little more detail. And here we can see the same pathways, but the key that I may already see that we have uh, some more and some different uh, reactions that are now colored, meaning that have some sort of uh, relevant functional annotations in our sequences that we've found. So once again, we can choose to just paint expression data in the map. So we can actually see which of these uh, reactions uh, we also have expression data for. Because of course, uh, in our set uh, of the transcriptomes, so in our both the gene and the transcript sequences, we may have found annotations for sequences where we have not measured uh, any uh, expression at all uh, in, in our actual data, in our actual samples. Uh, so. Uh, by painting the expression data in the map, we are only looking at um, uh, well at reactions where we have obtained sequences, which we have also uh, observed to be expressed in our specific samples. So, furthermore, we can choose to again only show results with differential expression data, and now rather than just the one uh, reaction here, which was uh, differentially expressed on the gene level, we have found a total of five reactions which show uh, at least one sequence each with statistically significant differential expression. So these are already different from the results that we obtained on the gene level and can allow us to look into the uh, these properties uh, between uh, the hibernation active states of our brown bears in a little more detail. So now on the transcript level, we can see different uh, reactions where we have obtained a multitude of sequences with uh, some sort of uh, relevance, some sort of annotation uh, belonging to these uh, enzymes. Uh, and there is one in particular which I wanted to showcase today, namely the enzyme code for diamine oxidase. By hovering over this little symbol here, we can clearly see on the map uh, which reaction this is relevant to. And if I zoom in here, we can see this reaction here takes us from tryptamine to the indole-free acetaldehyde. And what is interesting uh, about this particular enzyme, why I picked it to show to you today, is that based on the name of this transcript, which we have found to be statistically significantly differentially expressed between, of course, once again, hibernation and active states, um, based on the name of the ID of this transcript, I can tell that this is a novel transcript which was discovered by Flair. So our analysis today using the long reads, using FLARE and SCAMT3 to, uh, to identify novel isoforms which were not previously annotated and to further then using SCAMT3 to refine it to only obtain high quality transcript models has actually borne fruit in the form of this pathway analysis in that we have uh, discovered a uh, reaction here uh, with this specific enzyme where we have uh, not only found sequences that are uh, associated with this enzyme code. But furthermore, we have found a novel isoform that we wouldn't have known of beforehand, uh, which is differentially expressed for this specific reaction. And this is the only sequence that we have found that is differentially expressed here. So potentially, we have found uh, an isoform that is uh, involved in regulating this specific process, this specific reaction, this specific pathway uh, between the hibernating and the active brown bears. So that is at least to me, some very interesting uh, results that, of course, in a uh, more practical real-life settings, we would take uh, maybe a lot more time uh, to look into these results, to look at, for instance, what differentiates these, uh, this isoform uh, from the already annotated isoforms of the same gene. Uh, what is this gene known for uh, regulating? Does it have any relation to this uh, reaction that we can observe here in this pathway? Of course, we can also ask what about other pathways? We have obtained a variety of them and we can uh, look into uh, finding some, some relevant results in others, of course, as well. But today in our webinar, of course, our time is limited and I don't want to keep you too long. So uh, I think we can, with that, uh, conclude our, um, uh, our second session of the webinar today. And we can say that we have now become a bit more aware of the characteristics characteristics, sorry, uh, specific to long reads. Uh, we have heard about the uh, some of the biases that are affecting quantification, as well as uh, about the importance of using tools that are specifically designed for isoform-resolved analysis. 
We've also, of course, learned that Omics Box offers very convenient and user-friendly end-to-end long read analysis with a constantly expanding set, uh, suite of tools, uh, as well as very powerful functional analysis capabilities. And of course, towards the end, we have all also seen that we have obtained uh, functional insights from both known and novel genes and isoforms uh, through a differential transcript expression and furthermore, a combined pathway analysis. So uh, with that, I would like to thank all of you for uh, watching our webinar today, for staying with us all the way uh, to the end. Um, so if you would like to read more on this subject, as Enrique has already recommended, uh, the blog post on the recently published uh, longer gasp challenges, uh, as well as we have a blog post on isoquant as well on our website that I will link in the chat. And with that, once again, uh, thank you to everyone watching. Thank you to uh, Stefan. And I will uh, hand the session back over to you.